I uh, am going to preach on uh, Judges 1 and then the first five verses of chapter 2. I'm, I'm going to read just portions of that, though. Uh, I believe the verses, I gave Andrea the wrong verses in your bulletin uh, slightly, so I'm sorry. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to read ahead of time. Uh, again, not Andrea's fault, my fault, so sorry about that. But I'm going to read Judges uh, 1, 1 to 7, and then verses 27 to 36. And then the first two verses of chapter 2. This will give us a little bit of a a taste of the the whole narrative. um, And uh, and then we'll get into it. So, uh, reminder that this is God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, Who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. And Judah said to Simeon, his brother, come up with me into the territory allotted to me, that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I likewise will go with you into the territory allotted to you. So Simeon went with him. Then Judah went up, and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. And they defeated 10,000 of them at Bezek. They found Adonai Bezek at Bezek and fought against him and defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Adonai Bezek fled, but they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. And Adonai Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to pick up scraps under my table. As I have done, so God has repaid me. And they brought him to Jerusalem and he died there. Now, shifting forward to verse 27. Manasseh did not drive them out. The inhabitants of Beth Sheen and its villages, or Tanakh and its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or the inhabitants of Iblim and its villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages, for the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in the land. When Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor but they did not drive them out completely. And Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gizar. So the Canaanites lived in Gizar among them. Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Nehalal. So the Canaanites lived among them, but became subject to forced labor. Asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Akko or the inhabitants of Sidon or of Alab or of Aksib or of Helba, or of Aphek, or of Rahab. So the Asherites lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, or the inhabitants of Beth Anath. So they lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and of Beth Anath became subject to forced labor for them. The Amorites pressed the people of Dan back into the hill country, for they did not allow them to come down to the plain. The Amorites persisted in dwelling in Mount Heres, in Ajalon, and in Shalabim. But the hand of the house of Joseph rested heavily on them, and they became subject to forced labor. And the border of the Amorites ran from the ascent of Akrabim, from Salah, and upward. Now the angel of the Lord went up to Gilgal, to Bochim, And he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this that you have done? The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, a lot of names, a lot of places, a lot of details, but we pray that in this time that you have given us to study your word together, that you would clarify what we need to hear from it, that you would have us be pointed to the glorious reality of the gospel, even in this very difficult text of the Old Testament. Father, I pray that anything that comes from my mouth that is not of you would fall to the ground unheard And by your Holy Spirit, you would teach your people, and you would draw any to yourself that do not know you. It's in the name of your Son, Jesus, that we pray and ask for help. 
Amen. Real quick, before I get started, a reminder to kids that are in here, if you uh, want to go grab a Sermon Notes for Kids bulletin, uh, it's in the back cabinet in the back right corner. You're welcome to go grab one. Uh, Don't feel like you're going to interrupt me or anything, so go grab one if you want, and that'll be a good way for you to kind of follow along with the sermon as we kind of work through it today. All right, so everybody got all those places down? There's going to be a quiz afterwards. Just kidding, there's not at all going to be a quiz. So we're beginning this study of the Old Testament book of Judges. After even reading that text, more of you might be wondering why in the world I picked this book. I picked this book, though, because it is truly one of my favorite books of the Bible. I love the book of Judges. Uh, I I laugh almost every time because when I read the book of Judges, I'm reminded of uh, one of the poorest decisions that maybe I've made in my life. When I was in high school and I was in a youth group at a church just outside of Petersburg, Virginia, uh, we, a group in the youth group decided that one Saturday they wanted to go to Petersburg National Battlefield and ride bikes. They have a bike tour you can ride and check out all the different sites in Petersburg National Battlefield. I thought, I own a bike, I know how to ride a bike, I like history, so this is a slam dunk, right? I might even be able to impress a few people with my bike riding ability and my Civil War knowledge, because that's what impresses people, right? So here I arrogantly walked up to this event, thinking I was going to just enjoy this leisurely bike ride through the Petersburg battlefield, beautiful Saturday. Unfortunately, it was quite muggy that day. And while I'm a lot of things, I have a lot of hobbies, mountain biking is certainly not one of them. We got about three minutes into this bike ride and I realized that this day was going to be a lot harder than I expected. And while I was trying to keep up with the much more experienced group of bike riders I was with, I realized that water, Gatorade, whatever I could do was not going to help. Started to get very hot very quick, got a little bit dizzy. It got ugly. I even felt a couple times like I was going to throw up. It was not pretty. I didn't throw up, but I I felt like I was going to. I never went mountain biking at Petersburg Battlefield again, nor have I really been mountain biking since. Not an activity that I uh, am very good at or enjoy very much, um, although I respect it. I think of judges, I think of that when I read through Judges, because I think when those of us, especially those of us who have been in the church a long time, we've read the Bible, we've learned the Bible, we go to these books, especially in the Old Testament, with this kind of arrogance, like it's not going to be hard for me to pick up on what this is about. Like we have this, we have this sort of complacency about our abilities to interpret and understand the Bible. But then we get about a half a chapter into Judges and we realize we've made a huge mistake. We start reading all these places, all these names. We start hearing about guys getting their thumbs cut off and their big toes cut off. And far worse to come, by the way. And we start to wonder if this is something that we really should have been doing in the first place. This is why many of us avoid the book of Judges. We don't like to be uncomfortable. The book of Judges is disturbing. It's complicated. In places, it's downright bizarre. There will be times when you feel a little bit dizzy. There might even be times where you feel like you need to throw up. In the coming weeks, we'll hear about such events as a fat king having a bowel movement while he's being stabbed. A man having his head driven through with a tent peg by a woman. A man sacrificing his own daughter to fulfill a vow that he made to the Lord. And I'm not even going to get into what we see towards the end of the book. We'll get there later. There are so many moments in the book of Judges that make you ask the question, why on earth is this in the Bible? So why study Judges? Why study Judges? That's the question that I want us to talk through and answer this morning. Why is it not only good that we study this book, but why is it absolutely essential for us to study the book of Judges? 
Because I believe it is. It's hard. It's shocking. It's even sickening. But it's important we study it. And I would say it's important because I think it's, as Christians, it's very important we put our money where our mouths are. It is one thing to say you as a Christian believe the Bible to be the Word of God. It's one thing for us as a church to say that we believe that this is the holy, inspired, and errant Word of God. It's quite another to read the disturbing details of, Gen- of Judges chapter 19, for example, and truly believe that that text is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. How can a story about a fat king being stabbed and having a bowel movement possibly be breathed out by God and profitable for anything other than maybe an immature laugh? It's important we put our money where our mouths are. We are not called to apologize for the Bible. We're not called to merely tolerate the presence of these texts. We're called to taste and see the goodness of the Lord in His Word and see and hear the glorious truth that's being declared, that's crying out in the text of Scripture. That's what we're called to do here each week. And if we don't preach from texts like Judges, then we're doing ourselves a great disservice. I've talked to many kids that have come out of my youth groups over the years and they go to college and they ask me what church they should be seeking out. And I always like to say that if they don't reference parts of the Bible that you're not very familiar with, then go to another church. If you're not challenged by what they're reading in the Bible, then go somewhere else. We don't believe that God's given us segments of comfortable things to make us feel good about ourselves. We believe that this book, these 66 books penned by human writers, by the power of the Holy Spirit, are the true words of the living God. Every single word, every jot and tittle, as Martin Luther said, every word of this Bible is profitable, including the book of Judges. So I want to talk about the book of Judges. Why study it? Let's get into it a little bit. And I want to give us a little bit of a big picture view, a little bit of an introduction this morning. Each time I preach through the year, we're going to be continuing on in the book of Judges. I look forward to doing that with you. But I wanted to take some time this morning to kind of get a big picture view if you're less familiar with the book, but even if you are familiar with the book, to kind of talk through some details. And so let's look at two things this morning. The first thing I want to look at is the problem of Judges. The second I want to look at is the purpose of of Judges. And if you're a note taker, I've got that outline in your bulletin. You're welcome to take notes there. And I liked what George mentioned a couple weeks ago um, with his John study. Uh, If you want to take notes, hold on to these. You know, it'd be nice to have kind of a a little mini commentary after we're done. That's a cool idea Um, and, and something that you can do so that we can really study these books. So let's talk about the problem of Judges. There are so many problems in Judges. There are so many things throughout this book that we're going to have to deal with and we're going to have to talk through. So many problems. But there's one big glaring one we have to talk about right out of the gate. And that is the context of the book of Judges. The context of the book is the problem of Judges. The first big hurdle we have to get over. You can see the very first verse of the book, after Joshua has died, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? That's the way this book begins. This book is set in the backdrop, set in the context of a conquest of the promised land. God has given to His people a land for their own possession. That's the promise that He made to Abraham back in Genesis 17. The fulfillment of that promise is them coming into this land of Canaan. There are inhabitants there, though, in the land. And so God calls them to go in. This is the book of Joshua, essentially, to go into that land and to drive out the inhabitants. To drive them out completely. To take that land as a land of their own 
possession. And so the, there is a big problem here, though. It is a question that we can, we, can, we can thoughtfully struggle through. It's why and how a loving God, a God who is supposedly a God of love, could call his own people to this type of military conquest. It's not go in, make nice with the Canaanites, get to know them, right? know their culture, right? enjoy the land together. No, he tells them to go in and wipe them out. 100%. And this is extremely problematic, especially if we're viewing this now with 2023 eyes. Even the most kind of opposed to the postmodern culture of those of you among us, we still live in this kind of you do you kind of culture, right? I'm comfortable with what I do. You're comfortable with what you do. As long as what you do doesn't bother what I do, then we'll get together, right? We'll, we'll have a good time. We see this even in the church, right? This is true even here, right? As long as you know, your view of baptism doesn't clash with my view of baptism, then we're going to be good to go. But the second you start to trample on my territory, right, out come the brass knuckles. Just kidding, that's not literally a thing that happens. But you know what I mean, right? It gets ugly. We live in a you-do-you culture. And so viewing that through that lens to say, how could God possibly tell His people to go into this land with these innocent bystanders who God basically is just mad at because they don't worship the God He wants them to? How is it fair that God could tell His people to do this? It's a difficult question, and it's one that I hope you wrestle with as we begin Judges. You're meant to wrestle with it. I think that's the purpose of all the detail we have here. I want to offer two responses to this issue. It's not my goal in this sermon to fully answer this question. There is more time and other places to do that. But I do want to offer you two responses that I think the text gives us to kind of help to explain this problem a little bit. The first thing we need to realize about the, uh, the, the command of God to go in and wipe out the Canaanites is that the Canaanites are anything but an innocent people. That's the first thing we have to recognize. This is a very wicked people that God is calling His people to go in and wipe out. We have plenty of texts in the Old Testament, but also in non-biblical uh, texts in the ancient Near East that give us evidence to the wickedness of the Canaanites. If you want to read on your own uh, time in Deuteronomy chapter 9, Deuteronomy chapter 18, Leviticus chapter 18 would be great places to start. Here's some highlights. Things that the Canaanites were known for. Incest. Rape. Bestiality. Ritual orgies. Perhaps worst of all, they sacrificed their own infant children to the god Molech. And made routine practice of this. This was not occasional, temporary, few different instances. This was part of what it meant to be a Canaanite. These things were part of your life. Some of the worst and most outrageous depravity we've ever seen from humanity took place in these Canaanite pagan cultures in the ancient Near East. That's an important detail. If you just go at this, which most people do, if you enter into this text with a sort of those poor Canaanites kind of viewpoint, you're not viewing this text through the perspective that the Bible means for you to view it. It's very different. It's one thing to say God goes in and tells His people to wipe out an innocent people because He wants the land. God is somehow this kind of greedy land developer that we see in a lot of these movies, right? That's not what's happening, though. It's a very different thing to say that God is fulfilling covenant promises to His own people by using them to exercise judgment on a people that deserve judgment. There's a very big difference between those two things. And there's a really helpful indication of this in our text. If you understand the perspective, to to help us understand the perspective we're supposed to have. If you go back to verse 6, this seems like a super random aside. Right? Very, very random. Adonai Bezek fled, but they pursued him 
and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. That verse seems out of left field completely. Why thumbs and big toes? Why this random guy? Why did he get this treatment? The answer is verse 7. Adonai Bezek himself says, Seventy kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off used to pick up scraps under my table. As I have done, God has repaid me. Did Adonai Bezek see this as a savage, brutal, random, unfair act? No. He saw this as judgment. Why? Because he spent all of his time cutting off the thumbs and big toes of his enemies. There's a helpful lesson in there in terms of what God's judgment looks like, but this is the perspective we must have as we enter into this story. Commentator Ralph Davis had a great, great line to help with this, I thought. He said, the Bible does not claim that this conquest will be palatable, but it does insist that it was just. I love that quote. It doesn't insist that it's palatable, but it does insist that it's just. The Bible makes no apologies for this conquest. This is not typical of the way that God exercises judgment. There is no sort of prescription for this being the way God always deals with wickedness. Right? There is no calling for us here in Judges 1 for us in Lexington to go invade Salisbury and wipe out all the wicked people there to take the land as our own. That's not what's happening. But in this one time, temporary exercising of judgment, God shows His power and He shows His justice against wickedness. Using His people and fulfilling His covenant to His people by doing so. So that's one response. The second response, I think, is also helpful. We have to consider why God commands the Israelites to do this. Why is this the command? Turn back, if you will, if you have your Bible still open, turn back with me to Deuteronomy chapter 7. I want to go back to the original kind of command. This is where God tells them sort of uh, what to go do when they get to the promised land. Deuteronomy 7. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2, and then also verse 5, if you would follow along. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it, and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mightier than you, And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. Skip ahead to verse 5. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall break down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and chop down their asherim and burn their carved images with fire. You'll see in Judges chapter 2, much of that is repeated. We read that uh, earlier. But notice in both of those texts, God gives us insight into why He's calling the Israelites to do this. It's not merely about wiping out people for like a, a convenience sake or for practical purposes. The main reason God is calling them to wipe these people out is to wipe out their religion. It's to wipe out their paganism. He makes specific mention of crashing their altars. Right? Taking down their pillars, busting up their asherim, right? These specific instructions. He says, make no covenant with them. It's about wiping out their religion. Why is that important? It's important because God makes it very clear throughout his relationship with his people, Israel, that he will refuse to share their hearts with anybody. What is the first commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. That doesn't mean ahead of me, like a ranking. That means before my eyes, you shouldn't have anybody, uh, no other gods, right? I am your God. I am your God. I am the Lord your God. From the very beginning, the Bible captures God as a holy, righteous, eternal creator, but it also captures God in in a sense of as this fiance, right, who is who is being cheated on repeatedly by his rebellious people and is yet faithful and steadfast in his love and pursuit of her, his church, right, the bride. 
This seems like an unfair text unless you properly view in perspective what it is that God is saying. He's saying, go in and wipe out their religion because I will not share your hearts with their gods. This is not the controlling, obsessive, psychotic neediness. This is a covenant committed husband pursuing his bride. Husbands, I want you to think what would happen if you came home one day and your wife said, I still love you, you're still number one, but I'd like to bring in a, a live-in boyfriend just to make me feel valued, make me feel comfortable. Nobody in this room would judge you for freaking out a little bit at that, I hope. It would be a problem, I hope. I think hopefully that's fair to say. You would have a problem with this. And if you demanded that your wife not do this, I don't think anybody would say, man, he is controlling and obsessive, psychotic. Nobody would say that, right? Why? Because you've entered into a covenant, loving relationship. This is your wife, right? The very nature of a covenant, loving relationship is exclusivity. Right? There is no half-hearted effort in that. That's what it means to be in covenant with somebody. That's what it means to have your relationship be a covenant-loving bond between you and another person. If it's not exclusive, then it's not anything. Right? That's the point. And so when God says, go in and wipe out these people because their religion cannot exist while you live in the land, He's saying, I will not share your hearts. I won't allow you to be degraded by a culture and a religion that will tear you away from me. And in various points throughout the Old Testament, God is going to warn. And we'll see the next, uh, the next section of this. We'll see the warning that comes along with this. Letting this kind of syncretism come into Israel, what it's going to do is it's going to cause future generations to forget the Lord. Spoiler alert, that's exactly what happens. The book of Judges is a disaster. And it's because of this. It's because of this. So that's the problem of Judges. I hope that it gives you some help in thinking through this. My, again, like I said, it wasn't my goal to kind of fully answer the hard question, but I hope I, I gave you uh, some responses that could be helpful. That is the problem. What's the purpose of this book? Why does Judges in the Bible? Why does Judges exist? I think Judges serves us in two very distinct but very complementary ways. I heard a pastor describe it this way. Judges acts kind of like a plane with two wings. Right? The two wings of a plane do different things. They serve different functions. They both need to be there. But if one is just slightly off, then the plane is not going to fly right. And if one is gone completely, then the plane's not going to fly at all. That ends my knowledge of aviation. But There's two wings here. And there's two wings that are, that are equally important and equally needed. And Judges does both. And, they ser and it serves us in this way. The first wing is illustrated here in this text by the colossal failure of Israel. You look in your text at verse 21, verse 27, verse 29, verse 30, verse 31, and verse 33. What do you see in those, in those verses? You see a recurring, repeated phrase. Right? It's a variation of the Hebrew verb yarash. Right To say that they did not drive them out. They did not dispossess them from the land. Right, You see it over and over and over again in the text. And I chose to read you that long part with all the town village names and all the people group names. And I hope I didn't lose anybody. But I chose to read that to you because you need to see the repetition. You need to see the way that it's intended to land on your ear and on your heart. The writer does this very intentionally. One commentator said that as you read this, it might first seem like geographical tedium. But what it actually is, is a theological accusation. It's not ge a geographical tedium. It's not just places 
right, to bore you into to, to, to kind of drowning it out. It's a theological accusation. The main reason why they're going into Canaan to wipe out these people is not strategic. It's not pragmatic. It's not military. The main reason is a spiritual reason. God is calling for them to go in and remove the cancer. All of it. You would hope that if you had cancer, your doctor wouldn't go in, remove some, and say, well, it was their land first. Let them hang out there. Because cancer spreads. <laughs> right? Cancer continues to move. That's what God is calling them to do. And God is, by, by, by repeating this, they did not drive them out. They did not drive them out. What we're seeing illustrated here is the first purpose of Judges. The first purpose of Judges is to show us how deeply, deeply flawed we are. And it's not just the Israelites of this time. It, 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 is, it is God's people, and really people in general, how deeply flawed you are. God has given you this beautiful, perfect land. He's invited you to go in. He's given the Canaanites who are mightier than you into your hand, has said you will win those battles. Right? He's even illustrated through Judah. We saw at the beginning of the text how Judah was successful. Right? He's giving to these tribes of Israel victories ahead of time. And, and what are they? They still don't do it. They still fail. Right? And we're going to see this repeatedly in Judges, the just total flawed depravity of humanity and of God's people. A few years ago, Sufjan Stevens had a song that was uh, very memorable to me called John Wayne Gacy Jr. That was the title of the song. Um, it has this very haunting melody in the lyrics of this song, it, it's, it recounts the story of John Wayne Gacy, who was a, a serial killer in the 70s uh, near Chicago. John Wayne Gacy, one of the worst serial killers that we've ever seen. Right? He was known, famous for dressing up like a clown. That was kind of one of his things. And he would bury people in the crawl space of his house, right, his victims. Right? It was a horrible story. Right? And that's what this song is about. It's about John Wayne Gacy. And it's, it's a dark and difficult subject matter. The whole song is just this horrific picture of what this guy did. And it's, it's meant to make you realize how evil, evil can be. But then the last line is the memorable line of the song. Sufjan Stevens closes the song by saying this, Yet in my best behavior, I am really just like him. Look beneath the floorboards to the secrets that I have hid. Judges comes along, and the backdrop may be the wickedness of Canaan, but the story is about the wickedness of God's people. Judges is about the wickedness of God's people. It's about how bad we can be. And so Judges comes along, the first purpose, the first wing of this plane, is to show you in very vivid reality that the biggest problem that you have in your life is you. Judges is to make you scared of you. This is the reality. It uses these shocking and horrible and disgusting ways that the people of God devolve into this rabid people. By the end of this book, it is just mind blowing what they will stoop to. What's the message, though? It's that you and I are really just like them. What's the message to these Israelites? Right In chapter 1 and 2, you are really just like the Canaanites. You realize you're not any different. The only difference is that I have called you out to be my people. That's the only difference. So that's the first wing. You and I need to realize that we are far worse than we think we are. No matter how bad you think you are, you need to realize you're far worse and you're far more capable of more things than you even think. Happy New Year. Second wing. Let's get to the good part. The second wing of Judges is just as important, just as necessary. We must hear these equally. 
Because Judges, in its shocking, horrible, disgusting awfulness, also reveals to us that the main character of this story is a covenant-keeping God who is relentless in His grace and faithfulness to His rebellious people. God never gives up. God is there throughout the whole thing. No matter how bad it gets. You see it. After all that, did not drive them out. 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 Chapter 2, verse 2. The angel comes. He reminds them of this. Verse 1. I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. The same people that have failed to do the smallest thing that God has called them to do. God says, I'm not giving up. I'm still not done. He could have wiped them out right then and there. But He doesn't do that. It's not that there's not going to be punishment. It's not that there aren't consequences. We're going to see the consequences unfold very quickly. But in this moment, we get this snapshot of what is going to be true throughout the book of Judges, and that is that God never leaves or forsakes His people, even though they really deserve it. The beauty of this only lands with full weight if you realize the first wing is true. The second wing is only doing its job if you realize the first wing is there and true is that you are far worse than you could ever imagine. You're far worse than you think you are. You're far more capable of more things than you think. Pointing the finger is a worthless activity for you because the main finger that you should be pointing is at yourself. Your biggest problem is you. But even in that reality, even in that truth, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The second wing is just as true as the first. We heard it earlier in our call to worship. Over the Christmas season, my daughter Naomi uh, really grew fond of the new Grinch movie. The newer Grinch movie. It's not new really anymore. But the newer animated Grinch movie to the point where we watched it, I'm conservatively going to guess, maybe six, seven times. I don't know. I'm probably exaggerating, but it feels like we watched it a lot every day. Um... So I saw a lot of the Grinch. Um, I like the newer Grinch. I, I love the classic Grinch, obviously, but the newer Grinch movies, both of the live action and the animated one, they both do an interesting thing, and they add in this scene about sort of an origin story for the Grinch. They sort of tell you why he is the way he is, which I think is interesting. right? It flashes back to the time where the Grinch was a kid. right? And every time this would happen, Naomi would come around the corner and go, Baby Grinch! She gets super excited every time. Baby Grinch! And so you get this story. This baby Grinch who was left out in the cold. He's looking through the window at the the Who feast and he's seeing them all together and happy and he's alone. And you realize that what the Grinch really hates is not Christmas. What the Grinch really hates is loneliness. That's the problem. It's this moment of sympathy. It's interesting, right? Because it's the scene really before he goes and steals all the stuff. Right? The worst thing that he can do is steal all of Christmas from the Who's. Uh, but right before that, you get this moment of sympathy. He goes and it leads him to go and steal everything. I hope you know the story of the Grinch. If you don't, I highly recommend going to check it out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spoil it here, though. Um, so he steals Christmas. He gets up Christmas morning. He sees that the Who's are singing together, and he realizes that they didn't need their stuff in order to have Christmas. Right? And so he is moved to go and return all of Christmas. Right? He goes down into Whoville with all their stuff and he apologizes. And to his surprise, he's invited to the Who feast. Right? He's invited to this big grand dinner and that's the last scene of the movie. He reluctantly goes to the Who feast. And after a lot of awkward exchanges where he clearly is apologetic but doesn't he can't really show his face. He's ashamed of what he's done. Right before the, the, the meal, the Grinch gets up and, and makes a speech. This is what the Grinch says in this newer animated 
Grinch movie. I've spent my entire life hating Christmas, but I now realize it wasn't Christmas I hated. It was being alone. But I am not alone anymore. He then turns to Cindy Lou, and he says, thank you. Your kindness changed my life. The last line, as it's going through the narration, flips back to the Grinch. And he holds his glass up and he says, to kindness and love, the things we need most. And that's the way the movie ends. The Grinch's entire outlook, his entire priority, his entire life is rearranged when he sees and feels the kindness and the love of this little girl in this community of whose. And as he said that line, there was one day it struck me as I'm sitting here playing with my daughter, this movie's on, and I hear that line and I was thinking, man, that's the gospel right there. Here's the Grinch. He's done this horrible thing. He's completely ashamed. He realizes that he can't say anything that's going to undo the terrible thing he's done. But he gets accepted into this community and it's kindness and it's love that changed his life. It changed everything about him. And that is exactly what you're called into. That experience is what you're being called into. What is the point of Judges? What's the purpose of this book? It's to change you. It's to change you. How does change occur? How does this happen? First, it's that you realize that you're broken beyond fixing. You're broken beyond your ability to repair yourself. Nothing that you could do will ever fix the problem that you have. But once you grasp the full weight of that, once the full weight of that comes crashing down on your heart, you also receive this beautiful tidal wave of love and kindness and grace that is unrelenting in its power that God never ceases to send your way. As you confess your need, as you confess how bad you are, God comes along and He says, I will never break my covenant with you. I will never break my covenant with you. Kindness and love changes our lives. That's the Gospel. I could close there, but I want to mention one more kind of thing, which is more important probably which is the ultimate purpose of Judges. That is, the, that is the, the practical, pragmatic, whatever you want to call it, purpose of the book for your life. There is an ultimate purpose, though, of this book, and I would be remiss if I didn't cover that in this sermon. Towards the end of the book, there's a phrase that you'll see recurring again. And this is when the worst of the worst happens. There's a disclaimer on the last three chapters of Judges. It's going to get ugly. I plan to preach it. You may want to do, prepare for that. Four times, though, you see this phrase in the last couple chapters of Judges. In those days, Israel had no king. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. The depth of the depravity of Israel is related to us in telling us that there's no king and every man is doing what is right in his own eyes. The ultimate purpose of Judges is to make you and I cry out for a king. It's to make you and I cry out for a deliverer. We're going to see broken people. We're going to see broken judges. Really broken judges. The heroes of this book are not heroes, by the way. We're going to see failure. We're going to see ugly, shocking things. What does it ultimately all lead to? It's us longing for the coming of a real, true, righteous deliverer and a king. And that's what this book was intended to do for those people, and it's intended to do for us as well. Uh, Dr. John Currid, who's one of my Old Testament professors in seminary, he put it this way. The cry out for a true judge, a true deliverer, is perhaps never louder than it is in the book of Judges. The entire heartbreaking account leaves us in a deep desire for the true one who is to come. That's what this book ultimately is here for. We have a great opportunity this year as we study the Gospel of John and Judges. I'm not sure what Pablo is doing, but that's equally as important. I don't want to, I don't want to undersell him. But as we study the Gospel of John and you hear about this 
revelation to God's people, the word being made flesh, dwelling among us, right? Light and life being brought to the people. Don't miss that alongside the darkness that God's people were in before he got here, (laughs) right? We see these two things happening simultaneously, right? Beautifully vivid twin realities, your incredible need for a Savior, but an incredible Savior for your need. Present in every text of this book. Well, we were still sinners. Christ died for the ungodly. And through Him we might receive reconciliation. Because God never breaks His covenant with His people. His love will never let you go. Let's pray.